So biogeography in two parts. First of all, we're going to talk about how, um, how we understand what biogeography is. So biogeography is the study of ecological patterns across geographic locations. And it helps us understand how species vary in space and what types of spatial patterns influence species diversity and abundance. So here's a table from the book showing different forest types across the world at different latitudes. You can see their latitude and longitude and the approximate tree species richness. And so you can see that forests in the Amazon have orders of magnitude more species than forests in Southern California or the Pacific Northwest where, where we live or in Canada or New Zealand. Um, but then as you, as you approach the tropics um, in, you know, in either direction, species richness increases. So this is a question that we'll, we'll come back to in this lecture. So, you can, you can try to understand really large scale biogeography by looking at these patterns and biomes across the planet. So here you can see some, some pretty detailed biomes um, and you can see the political boundaries draw, drawn over the top. Um, <clears throat> so biomes would be something that's covered um, in a general ecology class or probably hopefully covered in your general biology class and um, something you can, you can dig into a little bit more in the textbook if you're curious. So what are some of the biogeographic patterns on Earth? Um, the first one we've talked about already, species richness and composition vary with latitude, um, and species richness and composition vary among continents, and we'll talk about why that is. And then finally, you can find similar biomes in different parts of the world, but they can also vary in species richness and composition depending on other physical about their ecosystems. So there's some really cool, <clears throat> cool research in the Amazon looking at biodiversity. This is a mural that was painted by Ray Troll. And if you stop the video and go to the link at the bottom, you can actually interact with this painting and it'll identify every um, one of the fish species in, in the picture. One of them I wanna focus on is in is this one. This is the Amazon River Dolphin. Um, <clears throat> it feeds on over 53 different species of fish, turtles, and crabs. It has very small eyes and it doesn't really depend on sight at all since the river is so murky and instead uses echolocation to identify its prey and their locations and capture them. Um, the other thing that I want you to do if you have a minute is just pause the video now and go to these two links. Um, the book talks a lot about deforestation in the Amazon and you can explore forest losses using Earth Engine, Google Earth Engine, and you can also explore some satellite imagery of the 2019 Amazon fires at this other link. So a lot of current biogeography work involves GIS platforms, and a lot of those platforms are moving online to things like Google Earth Engine, um, which is really fun because it's way more accessible. So pause the video and go check out these two links. Okay, welcome back. We're going to talk about spatial scales in terms of biogeography. So we, we talked already at the global scale, looking at um, Earth's biomes. And then looking at any specific part of the biosphere, you can look at the regional scale. Um, and you could zoom in further to the landscape scale or to the very local scale, like a particular forest stand. So something like smoke from those Amazon forest fires traveled globally. Um, but the fires themselves affected a very large region and some entire landscapes and definitely local, um, local, local scale burning uh, occurred. So a single, you know, well, I guess it's multiple events, but something you can talk about like forest fires in a particular year can have effects at all of these different scales. So you can also explore things like species diversity at these different scales. So when we talked about species diversity measures, um, it really depends on where you're measuring things. So if you were interested in all the species in a specific region or a regional pool at the regional scale, you'd be talking about something called gamma diversity. Okay, so it's the, the possible colonists for any particular community um, at a landscape or local scale. At those local scales, if you go into a site and you measure their diversity, you're measuring alpha diversity. So it's like who is here at this moment in time from this potential 
colonist pool at the regional scale. And then if you measure um, changes in diversity over time, you can, you can see what's called species turnover. So you might have extinctions, you might have immigration, you might have some species moving in or out. And that turnover is called beta diversity. So we can talk about species diversity in these different ways. And what's neat about beta diversity is that it's connecting local diversity with its regional diversity through that turnover measure. Okay, so some of the, the book talks about fragmentation studies. And I just wanna say that these are some of the earlier experiments that are looking at kind of landscape scale effects on ecosystems and communities. And um, the example in the book talks about creating fragments of forest in the, in the tropics of different sizes and um, creating these edge habitats and corridors to promote connectivity between habitat um, fragments. And these, these experiments had a huge effect on diversity. Um, and they found that edge effects, which tend to be negative for most species, can extend well into the size of the fragment. And sometimes the entire fragment can be influenced by these edge effects up to like a kilometer. Um, into the forest fragment. So that effectively reduces the size of the fragment even further and gives us a lot of evidence that large preserves are best. So if, you have, if you're ever kind of faced with the question, should I have several small reserves or a single large reserve? This is called SLOSS, single large or several small, S-L-O-S-S. -S. Um, a single large preserve is off, almost always best for preserving biodiversity. All right, so then we're gonna to move to talking about um, biogeography and kind of the history of study of biogeography. Alfred Russell Wallace is a good poster child for this topic. He was an avid English collector. And in 1852, after an early kind of uh, disastrous collection event, he traveled to the Malay Archipelago. And um, there he found some really weird patterns. And there was this clear demarcation between Asian species an Australasian species that is now called the Wallace's line. And you can see Wallace's line here in this picture. Basically, there are these kind of um, large biogeographic regions with some pretty severe distinct um, kind of transitions between them, but this is one of the, the strongest transitions along this red line here um, between the Oriental kind of biogeographic region and the Australasian biogeographic region. So each of these um, six large-scale biogeographic regions, now this is no longer thinking about the biome, but really the kind of group of fossils and the group um, kind of looking at species at a much um, broader scale. Each area contains kind of a distinct biota, like a group of species. And um, this also helps us understand a little bit why there's great diversity in the tropics. Um, you can see some of these shifts are happening. So you have um, two kind of converging biogeographic regions along the tropics in some places, not every place. And these biogeographic regions are connected to plate tectonics. So the movements of these um, plates around the globe through time. And so you can see the, um, the dashed lines are mid-ocean ridges where plates are moving apart and the solid lines are faults where plates are colliding. So you can see some really cool um, kind of correspondence between the biogeographic regions and these plates. Okay, we're gonna take a break here and I'm gonna pause the video and start a new one. So we'll come back to biogeographic regions uh, in a second. Oh, here we go.